There is the urgent necessity of a radical, conscious and calculated transformation of economic, social and political structures. It is as obvious and manifest as never before. And if the insurrectional potential exists as well, one also has to say that there are forces able to conduct such changes or at least are able to accompany the changes. However, these forces are not very strong, and this is a genuine historic defection. The reasons for this historic defection are many, they are numerous. numerous. I would like to just uh, quote some. First of all is the absence of a critical thought of democracy, which would serve as a basis for a genuine alternative to the model of the present power and the authoritarian populism which exists in most of the countries. The second reason is a political economy based on extraction and predation. We see this currently in Eastern Congo, for instance, where there is an ongoing war that we are witnessing, and this is a, a war which is not fueled by an emancipatory political project. This is a war which, right from the start, has been a, a war for hoarding mineral resources, and it will remain such a war of monopolizing mineral resources. The third reason is the major social diffraction that started in the middle of the 1980s, which resulted almost everywhere to an informalization of social relationships, to an unprecedented fragmentation of rules and standards and to a process of deinstitutionalization, which has not left out the state itself. What is even more serious is that this diffraction also resulted in the development of uh, many people who are kind of mavericks, people who are almost abandoned, who, literally speaking, have nothing to lose. And very often, they can't escape their situation. They can only escape their situation through war or migra migration. And this is, or hence, there is the irrepressible desire of millions of Africans to live elsewhere, to live not in their own region or country. And the fourth reason is the historical imaginary of power and culture, which does not only give priority to the present at the expense of the future, but which also tends to understand politics as an inverse form of the war of survival. Hence, the mandatory necessity today to demilitarize the, pol the policy as a condition of democratic uh, life. And if I say demilitarize of uh, the po politics, I'm not only talking about colonels, generals, sergeants, uh, coup d'etat, or of all the infrastructure uh, resulting in violence and fueling this violence. I would like to uh, cut the knot, which is based on a conception of enmity as an interference of my life, unites the political and, uh, and the right and duty to kill, or links the political to the act through which I appropriate and get what apparently belongs to nobody in particular, or I am provided preventively with life and everything that adversely, adversely affects me. I think that in the recent past, this conception of uh, the political as a zero-sum game within a community of enemies 
where everybody tries to win everything or everybody tries to avoid to lose everything and we're talking with the language of death, I think that this sort of the imaginary infrastructure of the political has deeply determined nature and the forms or shapes of social struggle. I think that you cannot, cannot really struggle and fight for democracy by basing yourself on such an infrastructure and it is exactly this infrastructure that needs to be destroyed and abolished. I gave you a whole range of reasons, and these reasons show why social struggles have often taken the shape of endless predatory wars. As that you said, there could be a type of democratic avant-garde that could develop in Africa. Can you maybe elaborate on that? I really believe this. I do believe in this Africa. I believe in the Africans. You see it. You hear it. If you listen to African music, in your introductory um, words, you always spoke about this um, <laughs> book of mine on post-colonial um, time. A lot of people say that it's an Afro-pessimistic Bible, um, this oeuvre. They didn't understand it either. A lot of times I wrote at night. I write at night. This is not a joke. I write at night. You know, nighttime is silent. It's fascinating. We have a lot of experience with things that happened at night. 90% of everything that's reported in social sciences are phenomena that happen during daytime. So that means we're not familiar with the nighttime. We only know this little about the night. Everything that we're reporting in science about um, everything that's happening is happening during the daytime. But the night plays a decisive role in the traditional African metaphysics. And why? Because, surprise, surprise, the night time is the time in which the knowledge of the world discloses itself. If you want to learn the truth about people, about the world, you have to ask the questions at night. And the ability of asking the essential questions at night is an ability that is unfortunately not shared democratically. There are experts, there are real experts who know how and when to ask these questions, but unfortunately they're in a the minority. I would not say that I'm part of this group. That's not what I wanted to say. But um, this work, this book that you referred to um, on post-colonialism is a book that I wrote at night. And when I was working on this book during the nighttime, I was writing and narrating things that everybody's familiar with, things that are happening um, every day. I always called it a sociology of the everyday life. and. While I was writing, I also listened to music, music from the Congo, similar to music from Mali or Cameroon, Senegal. That's, how should I say it? It's a celluric music. I say it's a, it's, it's a music that always accompanies big things. For example, an earthquake. If the, earth, 
if there's an earthquake and you look into the um, crevice, you can see it. You can read a lot in this crevice. You don't um, look at um, coffee powder. You look into the soil. You look into the crevices, into the geology. And that's what you need to do in Africa. Look into the depths. And this proximity to soil, to land, to culture is something that you can only achieve by means of music in Africa. And when you listen to African music, you see something developing from this rhythm, from the music, something extremely powerful, something extremely strong. You also see this in the Africans who emigrated to the United States, in Colombia, in Brazil. But they are particularly um, dominant in, in, in the United States. Um, thinkers like um, W. Dubois um, or Paul Gilroy understood this. And then at some point you reach the moment where your writing is inspired by this, where it can be nurtured, where it wants to be nurtured by this. You see a merger with the heritage of the continent. You dive into the past, into the cultural heritage, and I dove into it, and I can tell you we are optimists, but as you said, we are realistic optimists. This continent, Africa, is an object for all desires in the world. And sometimes newcomers come back. They were already there in the 1960s and left, and now they're coming back. There's Brazil, there's China, there's India. Plenty. And we don't want to build a wall around the continent to protect it. No, the continent needs to be open and the borders stemming back from the times of colonialism need to be torn down and a new realm needs to be created, a new space needs to be created. We need to give African we, we need to give African citizenship to the Africans who live in the diaspora and want to invest um, in the continent. We should not repeat the policies directed against migration. When Europe closes the doors, we, in opposition to this, have to open up. We have to create space. We have to really create a momentum a momentum where we can really achieve a synthesis which constitutes the success of the African continent. And in order to do this, we need to have grand ideas. And on the other hand, we have to be able to implement these grand ideas. And to do that, we need to have smaller units, smaller communities where these grand ideas can really be turned into uh, practical implementations. So this project of a future democracy needs to exist. Jacques Derrida talked about this concept of the future democracy. And just before he died, he wanted to think about this concept of future democracy. On the one hand, you criticize the existing democracies when you think about um, future democracies. But on the other hand, you also make suggestions for the future. In a world where the future is becoming more and more of a rare commodity. And for this democracy to exist, you need to have a desire for life, and that needs to be strengthened. And so far, it's more the will to kill that seems to be stronger than the will to live at the moment. And the African time will come. I believe that its time will come. Thank you very much. I think those were nice closing remarks.